this is an opportunity to actually move your opponent's chess pieces, not just your own. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited to have Stefan Spencer here with me to talk all about SEO and his book and just overall his journey that it, I've just uh, found so interesting. I was actually on Stefan's show, his podcast show, uh, I guess it was a couple months ago now. I'm I'm yep. losing track of time, but it, uh, but it was... Uh, we actually met through, um, I call him the amazing Joe. We'll talk about that a little bit. And, um, but let's, uh, let's just talk a little bit about Stefan and talk. He is really considered, the more I've dug into him, the SEO master and marketing expert. And his whole life has really been focused on not only building a company and becoming an expert, which I love to talk more about. Did he know he was going to become an expert in this and or not? And sometimes I feel like people just set set way on their journey and then they just figure out what they're really uh, good at that maybe comes easy, maybe is challenging along the way, but then they have these aha moments and uh with for Stefan, he ended up co-authoring three books. One of them that is is all three of them are a must, I should say. But one of them is just so incredible: the art of S SEO. If uh, if you don't remember any of the other titles, please please go and get the art of SEO. It will be so so useful to you. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But his other books are Google Power Search and Social E Commerce too, and. Uh, Stefan's worked with many, many amazing clients, including Zappos and Sony Store and Quicksilver and Chanel, and uh, very, very excited to have him talk on the show because as I always share with people, if you are not a lifelong learner, then you're bored. And that is so much of what Stefan talks about is, uh, is I think, really going to challenge your brain a little bit and get everybody thinking, and we can all benefit from it. So welcome. Thank you. And, you know, the, a, Very, an expression comes to mind when you were describing uh, if, if, if you're not learning, you're, you're bored. If you're not growing, you're dying. That's another expression I, I yeah. think is very important to keep in mind because, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for each day to come. I wake up, put my feet on the ground, and I say to myself, today's going to be a great day. I learned that from BJ Fogg, who I met through Genius Network, uh, which is how we met. And uh, yeah, that little habit just sets me off on a, on a wonderful uh, start to my day. And then uh, I look for opportunities to grow and learn and uh, become better. It's fun. I love it. I love it. Mindset, attitude, there's so much there. So let's talk about how did you get started? How did you become the SEO guru and really the the focused person for SEO for so many people and so many brands. Well, it was uh, coincidences, I think, that kind of culminated in, in, in a shift in my path. I was studying for a PhD in biochemistry, and uh, while I was doing that, I just built some websites. This was back in 1994 when the web was brand new. And you and uh, I started in the same year. Oh, yeah. yeah same year cool. of that, you know, the internet, right? So interesting. It was, uh, we, uh, and, yeah, we were using Mosaic browser back then, right? Yeah, yeah. Crazy, crazy time. And so for those of you who are, are not like, let's break down SEO for those of for those people listening that SEO is kind of this this important thing that they should know about, but don't really even know what it is. Yeah. Well, search engine optimization is a way to uh, provide a better first impression to your uh, your potential prospect, your your potential customer, before they even land on your website. Because the uh, most likely path they're going to take to get to you is by typing your name or your brand or the services or products that you offer into Google, and then they're going to see a set of search results. That's their first impression. Then they click, hopefully, 
on your web page in the search results and then they land on your site and then they get a second impression but you know how important the first impression is and you've blown it if you haven't done good SEO to make sure that not only are you ranking highly in the search results for the keywords you care about but also that all the other stuff that especially for brand results brand SERPs uh, search engine results pages for the the brand results that appear you want to curate all of it if you search for my name for example Stefan Spencer you'll see that everything on page one is either stuff that I have written or was written about me that I can influence or you know can, uh, I, I had some involvement in it being written or it's um, yeah just basically appearances TV appearances or my author page on Amazon uh, like these are things that I had a hand in rather than just leaving it to chance so that's really important that you can curate the results. And even if, let's say there there are some detractors going after you, um, you know, haters, hug your haters, <laughs> like Jay Bear says in, in the title of his book. But if you have stuff negative about you on the search results for your brand, you want to push that off onto page one. And the way to do it is to have other stuff that outranks it. So we'll you, this is an it. opportunity right. to actually move your opponent's chess pieces not just your own which is amazing so it's it's a it's a strategic mindset shift to think oh this isn't about tags <laughs> this isn't about getting links yeah those are tactical elements to it but in the book the art of war sun tzu said or wrote tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat so if all you're doing is trying to get all the tactics right, you're missing the huge opportunity to implement strategies. And when your competitors implement the strategies instead of you, and you're just in the tactics, that's when you just get slaughtered on the battlefield. Absolutely. And it's not just about, it, uh, you just touched on the competitors. So especially as it relates to brands. And I think that, you know, people think, oh, I've just got to focus on, you know, getting my brand up to the high levels. Yes, but you also have to watch at what competitors are doing because maybe they'll actually be grabbing that search and sending it back to their site. And which is obviously, I mean, not a not a good thing. And, you know, maybe you as a CEO is not really thinking about it, but you could be losing a lot of traffic. Yes. And to think about your indirect competitors at the same time as the direct competitors, because usually the direct competitors are not nearly as clued in to SEO as the indirect competitors. And who, who are indirect competitors? They are potentially affiliates, not just of you, but of your competitors. They could be uh, site owners that they're just trying to monetize their content. What used to be called back in the day, MFA sites or made for AdSense sites where they're just, it's a, it's a content play. It's a, it's a, a publisher that's monetizing through uh, Google AdSense or other platforms, uh, programmatic advertising or what have you, and uh, they could be making millions of dollars. I actually have a, a client that's a seven-figure earner that is making it all through uh, ads and uh, through affiliate links. Uh, and I'm not sharing anything out of school because they've actually talked about it on my podcast on Marketing Speak. It's Chris Parker, and the site is whatismyipaddress.com. It has like 8 million unique visitors a month, and uh, they're in, in the seven figures now. So it's exciting times, wow. but those are your competition. They're much more savvy than your direct competitors, typically. And, and so if you're trying to reverse engineer what your direct competitor is doing, you're missing the big picture. You have to reverse engineer Google and what they're doing and what they're cooking up. Right? They're implementing artificial intelligence all over the place. And you have to reverse engineer these indirect competitors because anybody who's outranking you in Google is a competitor. For the keywords that you care about, even if they're not direct keywords to what you offer, but they're reaching your audience. And I like to say that you want to fish where the fish are. Not that I go fishing or anything, but if you want 
to land more fish, if you want to catch more fish, go to where the fish are. And I'll, I'll give a quick example. Let's say that you have um, uh, baby furniture as part of your uh, offering, your, your product catalog. Maybe that's all that you do, baby furniture, right? And so the obvious keywords would be things like baby cribs and baby furniture, baby bassinet, bassinet, etc. Problem with that is they're pretty far along the buyer journey by that point. It's, it's it's a very competitive search. It's um, sure. There's a there's a lot of competition. It's it's uh, difficult to rank for, and there isn't nearly the search volume that you would expect. If on the other hand you go earlier into the buyer journey, up the funnel to where people have maybe just figured out, found out from the first ultrasound that their baby is a boy or a girl, what are they going to do as soon as they get home? They're going to hop onto Google. And what are they going to search for? It's not baby furniture. What do you think they're going to search for as soon as they hop onto Google? Gosh, I should know this having four kids, uh, but <laughs> um, I don't, maybe, maybe a site to actually buy it. Okay, so right? if you or, just found out the baby's, or, uh, the baby's uh, gender and you're like, okay, now we got to figure yeah. out names, right? So if they're searching oh. for baby names and you're like, well, that's great. They're going to figure out the baby's name. No, no, no. There's an opportunity here. If you're selling baby furniture and you go after baby names as a keyword, which has orders of magnitude more search volume compared to some of these other keywords that you were t targeting, you're going to get almost 100% expectant parents. Who else is searching for baby names? Nobody. Only expectant parents. Only hmm. your exact target audience. So what you're uh, looking for are these opportunities that are essentially the baby names equivalent keywords for your industry. And one of the best ways to find those keyword opportunities is to reverse engineer your indirect competitors. Very interesting. So in the case of, of my life, we actually, we knew names way before. We, we had family names. We had, so we weren't necessarily looking in the same way, but I, I'm with you and I do believe that that's, that the majority of people are actually looking at it. And uh, yeah, and I, I, how do you think it, it varies for a brand versus an individual. So, you know, if, if you're looking at Kara Golden versus a, you know, a company like Hint, what would you say is sort of the key things that are, that are different in the SEO kind of journey? Yeah. Well, what I find is that most people are neglecting their personal brand. They're focusing mm -hmm. on their company brand. And uh, I was uh, guilty of this. Back when I was building my, my first company, I didn't worry about my personal brand so much. It was all about the company's brand, uh, so net, net concepts. And I realized after selling the company, like, wait a second, that was a problem <laughs> because now that company has gone to other hands and I'm left with just my personal brand. So the personal brand is the only brand you take with you to the grave. Companies come and go. Hopefully you have an exit strategy because any business that's not got an exit strategy, you've got a very expensive job. <laughs> you're self-employed. You're not a business owner. So if you have an exit strategy for your brand, that's great. But there is no exit strategy for your personal brand, and that's the one that tends to get neglected. So if, if somebody's searching for your personal name, think about this first impression that they're going to get in the Google results. What does it look like? Does it just look like your LinkedIn is number one when it should be your, your company's web? I mean, your personal website should be number one. Is it that uh, you have a knowledge panel over in the right hand side, but it, it, it says that it's unclaimed with a button at the bottom that says claim this knowledge panel? Uh, or do you not even mm -hmm. have a knowledge panel over on the right hand side? Uh, so people will judge you based on that first impression. And they think that, oh, you're a big CEO or you're a big business owner or entrepreneur. Like, but these results don't really reflect that. There's nothing happening over on the right-hand side. Now, the person who's searching may not even know that it's called a knowledge panel, but that doesn't matter. They just know something's mm -hmm. missing over there. They search for some other CEO name and boom, there's some photos and, and links and uh, uh, social chiclets and uh, book covers and things like that. 
where's that for you? And, and also, if they see that there's not a lot of impressive stuff, you know, you weren't interviewed on uh, CNN or Forbes or whatever, and it's just like social platforms or maybe even just other people's uh, uh, stuff because you have a common name or maybe somebody else more famous than you has the same name as you. And so most of the stuff that's showing up isn't even you. That's a, that's a problem. That's 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 uh, you not having control over your own personal brand uh, presence in Google, the number one search engine. So it is important to maintain this this presence and and brand and build it out over time. And if you don't even have a personal website, how are you going to uh, how are you going to uh, really control your brand voice over time, your personal brand voice, because just having a page, let's say an about the founder page on your company website doesn't cut it. You need a separate site for you personally. And if you have a book or multiple books, each book really should have a, a, a separate website. A book should have a book website. So, <laughs> so I, I'm kind of opinionated so let's about say this. <laughs> No, no, no. I, I love it. So let's say, for example, this interview, right? You're like, it's going to, it will be up on the Kara Golden show. And then it links from, from my link, it'll link to, you know, this, what would you as sort of owning your own brand do with this? Because you obviously don't necessarily want it all going to you know, my site, right? You want to bring it back to, to yours. Maybe that's not a great example. Maybe it is. But what would you do as a brand owner? Well, that is a, a really, uh, really thought, thoughtful and thought-provoking question. Uh, if I'm a guest on somebody else's show, I first of all want to be very respectful of the fact that uh, they invited me onto my show. I'm not going to try and poach their traffic. So right. I don't right. want to take traffic away from your episode show notes page uh, or destination page on, on your site. I want to actually uh, promote it and it. drive more mm -hmm. traffic to it. And, and one way I do that that most people don't bother to is I have an interviews page, a press page essentially, but for uh, podcast interviews as well on my stephenspencer.com site. So if you go to my press page, which has not just um, TV appearances and uh, other types of, of, of appearances. Articles and... Yeah, so if I'm interviewed for uh, whatever, Ad Week or something, well, that one actually was a columnist for it, but the, you know, some other magazine that I'm interviewed, I'll put it there, but I also, every podcast, I put uh, a, a image of the, the podcast uh, cover art and a link to that episode on on their website because I want them to receive the traffic. I want them. To, I'm not worried about oh, that's a reciprocal link. That's very short sighted. Like oh, they're linking from their show notes to me. I'm not. I'm going to be stingy and not link back to them. That's very short sighted and it's not. Um, it's stingy. It's just stingy. I agree. And yeah. and and, and, agree. and yet you can also uh, get. Uh, f further leverage out of these appearances, whether they're on podcasts or TV or whatever. And, and as an example, you might have a sizzle reel that incorporates uh, little snippets from different podcasts and, and, and TV appearances, especially if it's got the lower third with the, the TV station's logo. I'm sure you've seen plenty of sizzle reels that just go uh, from one person to another person to another person introducing the person. And next up, we have Kara Golden. Kara Golden. And here is Kara Golden. We're very excited about Kara Golden. And, and it just goes from uh, next to next to next uh, in terms of the appearances. So you could do something like that. But would I take the entire uh, podcast episode transcript from your show, from the interview that you did of me, and put it on my site? No, I don't think that's right. I don't. I, that, that feels icky to me. Now, for my own show... I definitely take the transcripts of the interviews that I do and turn those into long-form blog posts 
where it's not just a uh, like a big wall of text, but it's something that mm -hmm. reads like an article. It's it's engaging. It's visually stimulating because we insert lots of images and, and we've got pull quotes and click to tweets and every time a book is mentioned a, a book cover with a link to that Amazon page for the book it just looks like a really interesting article and people love it uh, the, the people who don't have time to listen to a podcast will scan through or read uh, a, an episode like that they won't read a traditional transcript that looks like a wall of text so that is a really great SEO tip and, and it it works incredibly well I end up ranking for guest names and, and for topics that we talk about and so forth uh, for example uh, Scott Donnell who's the CEO of happy who's also a genius network member I rank on page one for his name <laughs> and it's because I interviewed him and we had a great conversation and uh, just the, the process of how we create these show notes pages causes that page to rank really well for his name so that's that's it. it's a no that's it's a win-win for for everybody just always yeah, think win-win no, that's, that's <laughs> yeah no i think that that's super great advice and i feel like one thing i always talk about being an entrepreneur is this idea of if you don't enjoy kind of doing puzzles right and and creating kind of what if scenarios, but also continuing to build. And I think, frankly, that's what SEO is. It just takes time, right, to actually build it and continue and focus and all of those things. So I, I really yeah, it, appreciate Well, it does take time, of... but and, and that might dissuade some people, but it, mm -hmm. it's an asset. Unlike if you're doing, let's say, paid search or paid social, the moment you turn off the advertising dollars, you've turned off the spigot in terms of your leads and sales. So that's a problem. Mm -hmm. With SEO, however, it's an asset that will continue to pay dividends month after month, year after year. So if I stop, let's say, link building for six months, all the previous work that I had done prior still ends up bringing me uh, traffic through that six month hiatus. I mean, it's better if I keep doing link building, but if I just go dark, no more link building, no more, uh, I, I, I could stop podcasting for six months. I don't recommend that. That's called pod fading. Don't do it. But if I did, I'd still get lots of SEO uh, benefit from all the work I had done pr uh, previously. So in, in the book, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by uh, Kiyosaki, um, Robert Kiyosaki, he, he talked about assets versus liabilities and an asset puts money in your pocket month after month you can't say that about paid search or paid social it, it, it's only uh it, it's only working as you're paying for it so i think that's an important mm -hmm. distinction i love it so i was on your podcast a few months ago and it's called get yourself optimized and by the way it's excellent it's uh it's such a it's a great podcast to learn from so many different people. You have amazing guests on there too, Stefan. So I enjoyed that you asked me about goosebump challenges. And the, that was that was something that no one has ever asked me about. So now I get to ask you. So talk to me about the, your goosebump challenge, your favorite one. Uh, so or maybe it's one coming up in, in uh, your life as well. Well, I get goosebumps all the time. It tells me that I'm connected, like I'm plugged in, because I, I look for guidance. Intuition is um, just basically the creator speaking and in, in, uh, whispering in your ear. And if you pay attention, you get goosebumps. So just today, for example, I knew that I needed to help this stray cat. And um, it was my guidance. It was like my, my, my spiritual GPS told me that I needed to do this. And turns out that that, that stray cat probably would have died without my intervention. And, you know, there's an expression that I heard many times, and I didn't realize it uh, comes from a, a holy text until just recently. But it's, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? 
So I this poor it. cat, I, we we would see it every week when we go uh, to this um, appointment, and we'd bring cat food and we'd feed it. Um, it had dry food every day. Other people would make sure it had food and water, but we'd bring wet cat food cans. And this uh, last week it wasn't there, and this week it was just really acting weird. And turns out it has some sort of uh, uh, I don't know. It's like a, a pelvic uh, or hip issue where it can barely walk, and oh, poor guy. it was really dehydrated. So I took it to the vet, and now it's overnight at a vet's, and it's going to get an X-ray tomorrow, and whatever the procedure is to bring it back to health, I'm going to pay for it. Yeah, and, and that's just uh, how I wish everyone would roll. And I can't say that I used to do that in the past. I probably would have just said, oh, I hope somebody takes care of it, uh, and it wouldn't have been me. But now it is me, and I just, that's, um, I don't know if that's an exact answer to your question, because I didn't get goosebumps, no, I but I did get guidance. I, I yeah. yeah, so there you go. I love it. An experience that you don't have every day that I will only make you uh, a, a better person, I think, along the way. So I love it, love it. Uh, so AI, I hear so much about AI and how, you know, it's, it's definitely getting integrated into people's businesses, even those that are not, uh, technology businesses. How do you see AI changing the landscape for SEO? Well, it's changing the landscape for everything and everybody mm -hmm. is going to be incredibly inf affected. So every listener right now needs to pay attention to AI. Uh, I, I was at Abundance 360 earlier this year, uh, and or no, it was actually well, virtually I was uh, I was attending, but this was uh, a year ago now in January that I was in uh, present in person, and I heard Peter Peter Diamandis say that there are going to be two kinds of businesses by the end of the decade: those businesses that are using AI at their core, and those businesses that are out of business. And I I don't think that's hyperbole. I really don't. I think that mm -hmm. we need to think differently as business owners because uh, AI is going to change every aspect of business, of life, of human interactions even. But we can't lose our soul in the process and our, our, uh, our, our, our humanness. But we do need to be aware of uh, what the implications are. So for example, Let's say that you have a copywriting team or just a copywriter that's helping you with whatever, you know, stuff, uh, email newsletters, web copy, etc. Well, now there are tools like conversion.ai that will write entire blog posts for you. You just give it a topic or you pose a question. You could, for example, with GPT-3, which is uh, Generative Transform, Transform Platform 3, I think is what it uh, stands for. It's from OpenAI. Uh, with that technology, uh, you can just ask it a question or give it a, 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 an instruction and it will create a work of art essentially, whether it's written word or it's an image or whatever. So for example, if you Google for Elon Musk GPT-3 poem, you will find a poem written by an AI, the, the GPT-3 AI. And it is hilarious and, and, and thought-provoking and clever and witty. It's just amazing. i got to check this out. Like, for example, so in, you go, uh, so you yeah, so Elon Musk, one more time. So GPT-3 poem or something along those lines, right? And you will find that the instruction to GPT-3 was write a poem in the style of Dr. Seuss about Elon Musk and include stuff about rockets and Tesla and, and so forth. And it comes back with the most clever, well-written poem uh, in the style of Dr. Seuss. And here's a stanza from it. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send my Mars rover to Red Planet U. <laughs> like, what? I love That's it. brilliant. I love it. So if, if, yeah, if AI can already do that, and you can say, hey, I need a weekly blo uh, blog post or I need a weekly newsletter and... I just want to 
hire a copywriter, no, maybe you don't need to hire a copywriter. Maybe you just need to put the right inputs into a tool like GPT-3 and boom, there you go. So that's just one small aspect. Imagine how much of business is going to be uh, just uh, disrupted, completely disrupted. Shift so in the, in the space, AI. yeah. And so if, let's just take the the specific uh, question that you you posed about uh, SEO and, and AI. There's really there's really only one way to outsmart an AI, and you got to think about Google being the one of the most plugged in. Uh, advanced AI-based companies in the world. I mean, they uh, they they bought uh, uh, DeepMind and incorporated that into their business. They they uh, they bought Boston Dynamics, and now they've got the uh, the Terminator robots and everything. Like it's crazy what Google Alphabet, really the the parent company, and all of its uh, its its you know child companies uh, can do with all the AI that they have. So how do you outsmart an AI? Only one answer with another AI. If you're not playing with AI to uh, get your rankings up higher, uh, you're gonna be left in the dirt. Yeah, so there are tools that are, are AI based. Market Muse is, is, is an example of, of an SEO tool that has AI, but most SEO tools will need to have AI in, uh, in, in their tool set in order to uh, still be relevant in even just a short period of time. And, and you as a business owner or you as a marketer need to know uh, what the capabilities are for uh, these different AI tools and, and how you can even write your own ha internally uh, uh, tools, ba AI based using Things like GPT-3 or um, it's even even uh, like IBM Watson is another uh, thing that you can uh, yep. essentially rent time inexpensively. Uh, so interesting. From, uh, yeah, it's just it's amazing. It's a brand new, uh, like brave new world, and, and I, I wouldn't be intimidated by it. I'd just be excited by it and just like dive in. I love it. So social media. One of the things that you uh, you actually have a you you have a ton of experience in social media, obviously on rankings, but how really changing or how much social media has changed in the landscape, the world over the last few years is dramatic. But you've got a course around this topic too that I actually would love to take the viral social media for massive traffic uh, one that I think is is pretty cool. And I've talked to a few people who have taken it and they've said that it's it's pretty darn interesting and and you've, they've learned quite a bit about hashtags and et cetera. What what's your couple minute pitch on on the course? OK, well, um, thank you for those kind words. I think that it again it is very important to be strategic rather than tactical. Start with the strategies and the best way to do this is to think how can I create something that is viral worthy or buzz worthy? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have something like that, then you're essentially, you know, putting lipstick on a pig. And and that that won't work. So what is uh the right strategy depends on uh, the, the topic space, the industry, et cetera. You might have a lot of wiggle room to, to do kind of off-brand things or, or uh, like be snarky or, uh, or, or punk somebody or whatever. And then there are the very conservative industries where they can't even put testimonials on their website. So it depends on you know, how much wiggle room you have. But let's say that you do have some and you first of all need to figure out what the topic is uh, if you already have that then you just put in to let's say a google search that topic plus i would add like if we're trying to figure out who and what is viral worthy we need to go to a source that has dialed this in they figured it out and who better than buzzfeed buzzfeed just nailed it I mean, they're worth over a billion dollars. Clearly, 
they've figured something yeah. out in order to be uh, that successful. So we're going to put in the topic, whatever that keyword um, is, plus site colon buzzfeed.com. No, no space after the colon. So what this search result will show you is a whole bunch of pages on the BuzzFeed website, articles mostly, that are about the topic. Let's say that we're trying mm -hmm. to talk about, uh, I don't know, let's say, I mean, flavor water we're talking is about too, entrepreneurship. Yeah, too, that's too specific. But if we were to broaden it a bit to bottled water, there's probably some funny okay. stuff online about bottled water, but we, yeah, we could pick entrepreneurship. But I would, I would. That's very, well, very broad. No, I like the bottled water. Sorry, I want. I like the bottled water. So we do bottled water. Yeah. And then site colon buzzfeed dot com. Yeah. When you say and, and, site colon, how do you S -I -T -E, for those of and then the colon character. Okay. BuzzFeed.com. And it doesn't have to be BuzzFeed. I really like BuzzFeed and, and the kinds of headlines or topics, uh, titles that you'll see are going to be usually pretty good. But uh, there are plenty other viral sites like Distractify, Viral Nova, Board Panda, uh, uh, Upworthy that you could do the same thing with. Okay. So here are a few examples. I love it. The bottled water you could that, that you buy could be full of plastic particles. Oh, that'll freak some people out, right? Now, you might think, well, that's a little too heavy. I want stuff that's humorous, you know, entertain me with <laughs> funny stuff. Well, you could then do uh, something like water funny, site colon buzzfeed.com, mm -hmm. and then you'll find other types of articles. Uh, 21 water-related memes that are just too good. Yeah. That's pretty good. I now, I'm not it. saying copy and paste these headlines and, and do your own version of the article. That's a little lazy and it's uh, it, now technically it's not copyright infringement if it's just a title. You can't copyright uh, a dozen words, but it, it feels lazy and just not good, karmically speaking, to, to do that. But it's inspiration for the hook. Once you've I, you've dialed mm -hmm. in what that hook is, so let's say it's water-related memes, uh, or here's another one. People on TikTok are spilling water on their babies, and, okay, I have to click to see what the rest of it is. That, that, that's another way to bait people, is don't give the full headline <laughs> or make sure it gets truncated in the search results so they have to click to see the rest of it. Uh, that That sort of tactic is creating a curiosity gap. That's very important for the headline or the title to have a curiosity gap. If you give the punchline in the title, nobody bothers to click to read your, your article. And we want people to actually go to your site. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the title. People on TikTok are spilling water on their babies and the reactions are incredible. That just gives away just enough to maximize the curiosity gap and make me want to click. So that curiosity gap is that tension that you feel, that, all right, all right, I've, I've got to click on that. I've got to see what that's about. That, that sounds really, really good. And that you need to become masterful at. In order to succeed in social media and just generally on the web, you need to be a master of creating a curiosity gap. And it's not just in the headline, it's everywhere. You know, the, um, uh, Eugene Schwartz, who wrote Breakthrough Advertising many, many years ago. He explained that the job of the headline is only one thing, and that's to get people to keep reading. That's it. You're not trying to sell your product or service in the so headline. True. Just keep them pe keep reading. And, and so if you write headlines that do that and, and maximize that curiosity gap, that tension that they feel like they have to relieve by clicking and, and reading more or just continuing down the page, You've nailed it. And, and so that's got to show up everywhere. Newsletters, website, social media, everything. Even when you're speaking in YouTube videos and on live streams and podcasts, think in terms of those kind of sound bites and creating curiosity gaps. How can we keep them hooked? How, how can we have open loops that we don't yet close so they have to keep listening? Kind of like the TV news back in the day. I remember when I still watched it. They would bait me the whole time. And coming up next uh, soon is the dog who reads Braille. And I'm like, okay, 
All right, I have to watch that. I have to watch that. And of course, it's the very last segment. I'm just so angry by the time that the the That's entire what always up, happens, it's, right? It's yeah, but they do it on purpose because they want to bait you and keep you watching all the yeah, horrible just... dark news <laughs> until finally the feel good story. I love it. So, real quick hashtags. What is, what is the magic hash? The I mean, along those lines, what would you say is the magic piece on hashtags? Okay, well, first, you need to know what hashtags are trending that are relevant. So there are ways to do that. You can see hashtags, uh, for example, if you go to Twitter's homepage, you'll see what the trending hashtags are. But that's too general. If you're trying to get specific into your niche, you need to be able to use a tool that tells you the hashtags that your audience is using. Because then, if you use those same hashtags, you're in where your audience is. You're fishing where the fish are. And the tool I love to do uh, to use to do this is called SparkToro. SparkToro.com. It's actually founded by or co-founded by my co-author on the Art of SEO on the first two editions, Rand Fishkin, who also founded Moz. Mm -hmm. The tool is incredible. What it does is you, you can specify, for example, uh, competitors, um, uh, social media handle on Twitter. You could specify their website address. You could specify their name. You could specify uh, just a keyword and then say people who follow this person or this account, people who you know, just uh, type these words in as the, or they, they include these words in their bio on, on Twitter or whatever, or in their tweets or, or social posts. People who are, um, you know, let's say, watching certain YouTube channels, you can specify all these different things and say, show me that audience. And not just I show me it. the audience. Like I don't, I don't get to see the names of the people, right? <laughs> that would violate privacy. But what I can see is what are they listening to? Podcasts, right? Which podcasts are they listening to? What YouTube channels are they subscribed to and watching? What social accounts are they following? And what websites are they visiting? It's mind-blowing. Oh, Incredible. and by the way, what hashtags they're using. Isn't that cool? So I if mean, they're using so a certain hashtag and they... I didn't know about it, I can just start using that hashtag and now I'm suddenly visible to that world of people because they're using that hashtag, they're seeing what other people uh, are are posting with that hashtag and now I'm in I'm in that group. So the net of it is you shouldn't be using the same hashtag over and over and over again either. I no, mean you should probably except, be using a mix. Except there is a there is a an except. If you're trying to build a brand with a de mm -hmm. you know demand generation tactics, you're trying to get um uh, people to be interested in something that they haven't been interested in for a long time. So uh, Rand Fishkin gave this as an example in one of his bo uh, blog posts a while back. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers as a search keyword was very stagnant for many years. Didn't get much volume beyond what you would expect. You know, it's not like he's around anymore and his show is not uh, exactly, you know, on the reruns or whatever. But there was a documentary that came out about him. Uh, what, what was it called? Something about uh, my neighborhood. Wonderful documentary. I love that. It okay, created amazing. all this demand. He was, mm -hmm. He's a, uh, what a wonderful soul, Mr. Rogers. Amazing, amazing. I'm actually having uh, his, his former neighbor on in a few weeks. And uh, yeah, really, he did a, the PBS documentary that you're talking about there was the movie with tom yeah. hanks and then there was the documentary yeah. and so the gentleman that came out with that documentary i is uh is actually coming on my podcast in the next couple of weeks and talking oh, so you'll have to so catch cool. that one for sure Stefan. yeah well, you know there are no coincidences like literally there are no coincidences any coincidence is actually divine intervention so <laughs> the fact that you're yeah. having uh like that connection is really amazing okay so that particular um uh, topic of Mr. Rogers suddenly spiked in in a uh, search volume and also related keywords because of all the demand generation 
that the movie was doing and the documentary was doing and so forth. So if you could think in terms of, I want to create that kind of uh, buzz for my thing. It doesn't have to be a movie. It doesn't have to be a book. It could be a product launch. It could be whatever. Mm -hmm. Then you might have your own hashtag. Or if you're trying to create a movement, Right? I love But movements. otherwise grabbing it, looking at Spark Toro or uh just to try and figure out what other people are doing is is great. I love that. Yeah. So Stefan, this is amazing, amazing. And where can people find you? Uh, <laughs> StephanSpencer.com is my main website. Lots of videos and recordings of past uh webinars and conference presentations and so forth there uh lots of free stuff uh free downloads and articles and everything and i have two podcasts so get yourself optimized is one that you had mentioned that you had been on and uh i'm very passionate about that it has nothing to do with seo even though it sounds like it it's all about like being your best self really like biohacking and entrepreneurship and spirituality and relationships i've had such incredible guests and carrie you're you're one of them and my other show marketing speak is all about mostly online marketing but how to just do outside the box uh, marketing and get uh, incredible returns from it so marketingspeak.com and get yourself optimized.com I love it. Thank you so much. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And definitely give Stefan five stars. And thank you so much for coming on. You are just a just so much education for everybody. And like he said, there's lots of free stuff. So definitely check out his website, too. And it's it will you could spend all day and now you gave us a few other places to go to Spark Tour O2 and lots of other places to go spend your days and uh, your weekends just going and checking everything out. So thanks again. And everybody join us on the Kara Golden Show every Monday and Wednesday. And I also just launched a new series called Author Talks. And we're we're talking to all kinds of authors on LinkedIn Live at least once a week. We're nailing down a day, actually, a specific day to do it. Um, but we've already had a, a couple amazing people and uh, look forward to so many more coming up as well. But thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Bye-bye.